Not a con. At any rate, uh, to give you a little background on FARC, some of you may have heard this before, some of you may have not, but uh, about seven years ago, FARC looked like this. Uh, that was essentially all that was there. In 1997, I reserved the domain name because it was available, and at the time, there's this buzz about how all the four-letter domain names were about to disappear, so I figure I better grab one before they took off. Uh, and at the time, I didn't have any good idea for what to put there. And it just so happened the day that I reserved the domain name, somebody sent me this picture of the squirrel with their large nuts. Uh, incidentally, not Photoshop. That's an honest-to-God picture. <clears throat> I've actually since come into contact with the guy that took the photo. Um, every, every time somebody sends me a picture of that guy in somebody's T-shirt or whatever, a public sighting, I'll forward it to him because almost always it's not licensed and... The guy's a pretty cool guy, actually. He told us we could go ahead and use that whenever we wanted to, as long as we gave him proper attribution, and so try to help him out. But he, he confided to me once that he says that he's, he's a photographer that's been in the business for 30 years. He's taken probably upwards of 100,000 photographs, and to have the one picture of his entire career <laughs> that everybody has seen be this is pretty humbling. Uh, <laughs> At any rate, I put that up there because I didn't have a good idea for a website, and I uh, decided I wasn't going to actually put anything up until I had a good idea for a website. One night in 1999, I had two good ideas for a website. One was what eventually became FARC. The other was a Indian curry recipe database because I'm a huge fan of curries, and there's only one other website that I know out there that you can actually find a good collection of curry recipes at. So there was an obvious you know, niche waiting to be filled. And I, honest to God, sat up that night thinking, which one should I do? And I went back and forth in my head over and over again and finally said, well, I'll, I'll give the news thing a shot. We'll see what happens. Started out, it, uh, it, it looks pretty much like it did today. Uh, less advertising, obviously, because we didn't have any. And uh, just kind of updated it on a manual basis, rolled it out the door in February of 1999. Added comments about a year and a half later. It ended up uh, going from 50,000 page views the first year to a million the second year, which was phenomenal until we ended up hitting last year it was 450 million page views. That's uh, somewhere north of most United States daily newspapers. Um, we're just slightly ahead of Chicago Sun Times. Uh, we're just slightly behind the LA Times, depending on what's going on. They end up having uh, interesting spikes that don't quite mesh our traffic levels. Um, I, I came to find out, interestingly, over the course of doing FARC and talking to a whole bunch of people that do newspapers, there's a strange conundrum that most local newspaper websites have, and that is that all of their traffic comes in in the morning between 8 and 11 o'clock in the morning. And they started inviting me to come to their conferences because they were trying to figure out why our traffic picks up at 11 o'clock in the morning and goes on until 7 pretty strong. doesn't really even die off until about 1 in the morning, and even then it stays you know, relatively strong all the way till about 6 a.m. and picks back up again. They're kind of mystified by this, considering that our website is completely built out of their stuff, so technically it shouldn't, it shouldn't have different readership patterns, but it does. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tell them why. I don't know. I was surprised to find out that they didn't get traffic outside of 8 to 11 a.m., so I, I couldn't help them out much. But at any rate, um, a question that people usually ask me was, was there any one moment where the, the traffic really took off? And there really wasn't. Um, there's only one that I can remember out, off the top of my head, actually two. One happened recently, but one that d didn't happen recently was we got mentioned in Playboy in 2001. They have a little internet section. And some guy was just writing about his favorite internet sites and having to toss us in there, and we actually got a little bit of a spike out of that. But that and the one that we caused ourselves this past uh, couple months ago where we tried to buy the naming rights to the fleet center up in Boston and call it the FARC.com Duke Sucks Center, we ended up uh, causing our own media spike through that. Uh, that was the only other thing that ever actually gained traffic. And what was amusing about that is that we've had an article written on us in Time Magazine uh, in USA Today and a few other places and have not seen any noticeable traffic from any of those at all, which is kind of amusing. <laughs> The uh, talk I wanted to give today was kind of an amalgamation of uh, things that I've come across from running FARC. Um, I've kind of uh, seen uh, some very odd patterns in the media after reading practically every news article that's come out in, since 1999. Uh, it, it's very similar to, uh, in my memory anyway, the situation that I have where when I was in college, I, my junior year, I spent in England. 
studying abroad. And that year, I did not see any of the movies that came out because they were on a three-month delay and they all pretty much sucked anyways. But it's, it's really always funny to me when I'm sitting around talking with friends about movies we've seen and somebody will go, oh, did you, what about that one movie such and such with Christian Slater? And, 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 and I'd be like, what? What are you talking about? And there's always this little hole in my memory from that period because I didn't go see anything except for Wayne's World 2, which, you know, that's, that's easy to forget. So uh, as a result, though, I, I have this bizarre memory for current events that goes right up to February 1999 and then just drops off the face of the planet. If anything weird happened before that, the odds of me remembering are not high. Anything after, though, uh, it's, it scares me to death to find out that I can catch a repeat in my own head two or three years later that I see going up on the main page. Uh, now, that having been said, the next question that's in probably some of your minds is, well, how do we end up with repeat articles on the page at all anyway, if that's the case? Well, we have repeat articles on the page because we're switching link picking guys. Usually I'm leaving on a trip or coming back from a trip, and we're switching up. And you, the other guys that pick the links don't tend to read the page when they're not actually picking the links, and so that's when that happens. But. At any rate, uh, just a few of the things I've noticed. Uh, one of the things is the media tends to reflect some very interesting and scary things about society. Uh, one of the things which is pretty obvious is people love violence, without a doubt. And it isn't just uh, particular to the United States either. Uh, Japan in particular comes to mind as a culture that seems to enjoy violence. Uh, and uh, if that offends any of you, tough shit. The, uh, in particular, uh, the uh, outrage over the violence that you see in the news really kind of breaks down to the patterns that you see in the, uh, the film industry where people will get really bent out of shape over small children and dogs having violence committed on them, but people that doesn't really have a, no one has a problem with that. Uh, my theory is is because we're not exposed to it that much. It's one of those things where Hollywood's had a, uh, had a moratorium against ha harming dogs for a long time, and so when something like that actually occurs, people get really bent out of shape. Uh, case in point, one of the articles on FARC from about two or three years ago was a, uh, a guy that, whose neighbor's dog was running through his yard, and so he doused it with hot oil or something or other. I can't remember what the deal was. Uh, didn't kill the dog, but it was a $13,000 medical bill, and uh, we actually uh, helped people raise money for that, and we $8,000 of the $13,000 medical bill actually came from us to uh, help the dog out. But then, again, that engendered certain discussions about, well, why is everybody getting really excited about this, given the fact that there are so many other horrible things that happened? And that, that's just one of the peculiarities that, that I've noticed, and I think the media tends to reflect that. Uh, people tend to like a lot of sex, not surprisingly. It's not just the Europeans either. The Europeans just don't have any problem with it. In the United States, it's got it's kind of like the way... Uh, uh, the joke that comes to mind was it's the difference, what's the difference between uh, Jews and Southern Baptists, and the, the Jews don't recognize Jesus Christ as the Lord our Savior, and Southern Baptists don't recognize each other in the bar on Saturday night. It's, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, you, would, you would, from hearing people talk, you wouldn't think that, I mean, just random people you would meet would be porn hounds, but according to our traffic records, everybody is, as it turns out. We can't generate or near the amount of traffic that we can on a boobies link uh, for any other news article about anything, period. Um, Part of that has to do with the fact that our audience is so diverse, um, as opposed to, say, slash dots, which is very, you know, tech-centric, and everybody's pretty much alike, and they tend to like mostly the same kind of tech-heavy articles. On FARC, you've got attorneys, you've got, I met some guys that run a fruit packing warehouse in Miami. Uh, I mean, just the whole gamut of people from life situations, and any given news article is not going to attract that much attention. But uh, boobs, though, I mean, that's, that's universal. It, 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 it's just interesting to me to see that it, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it doesn't really come out. People try to pretend that that's not the main reason they go to FARC, but that's usually the second thing people will tell me. The first thing is, love the website. Second thing is, those boobies links are great. Yeah, yeah, I know. So uh, it, 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 a good example of this is that uh, charlotte.com, um, which is a website obviously out of Charlotte, North Carolina, um, did a, and to my knowledge, the only time they ever did this because of the complaints it generated, uh, a best stories of 2001 based on the actual traffic, not the popularity of the actual site. And the number one link for the entire year, most of them were sex related anyways, but the number one link was a guy who beat his son senseless and ended up in jail because he found him out in the barn having sex with a family dog. That was the number one story of 2001. So uh, along the same lines, I did, a, uh, I did a visit to the screensavers earlier this year, and they asked me to pick up the best uh, articles of 2004. And I thought, well, that should be too big. So I, I went and I, I pulled up the database and loaded it up in order of traffic. And I, I found 
there was one, I don't remember the, oh yeah, it was uh, Janet Jackson's boob was uh, number one based on traffic. But then number two, after excluding all of the boobies links, was like 2,000 links down in the cycle. <laughs> No joke, and I, I can't even remember what it was now. But at any rate, I, so it ended up being one of those things where I just had to completely just make that list up because there was just no accounting for taste. So. Um, people also like funny news, and by funny news, I mean not necessarily news that is funny, but news that is filtered funny. Um, uh, people would much rather be reading the weird stuff than the real stuff, which is probably what I would credit most of our traffic coming from. I mean, not only are we, we're not just doing real news, we're doing straight news, but then filtering it through a weird filter. Uh, basically, though, we've also been seeing patterns in the media where they've been drifting that direction themselves. Um, for example, CNN now at any given time during the day has one or two links in their top six that'll be, you know, like finger found in Wendy's chili. Now, I don't understand why on CNN that orders that am amount of attention. I mean, with us, you know, that's a, that's a big story, but with, <laughs> with CNN, where you've got, you know, five or six links to basically cover all of the news that's even worth seeing, they've always devoted that last one to something completely bizarro, and in some cases, the last two. Um, strangely enough, we had an, uh, a, a database outage this week, and we lost two days' worth of data, which was you know, no big deal as far as I'm concerned. But uh, we ended up having two days' worth of uh, total FARC subscriptions evaporate because uh, the PayPal system will continue to try to send them if it doesn't get any kind of reaction off of our database. But our database did react, and then it blew up. So I had to go back and back out all those transactions. Turns out on April 6th, there was a uh, sign-up from a PayPal account named CNN with a guy uh, whose email address was at turner.com that signed up for it, and I thought that was kind of interesting. I wonder what those guys are doing. I have a contact over at CNN. I asked him if uh, he knew who that was, and he's like, no. He's like, that's just probably just some other news writer that's looking to kill you know 12 hours of his 16-hour workday by not doing anything. <laughs> um, another conversation I've had in the last few years is with uh, IOL, which is a, uh, it's a news organization based out of South Africa. And they were telling me that they had made a decision based on the traffic they were just getting from us to skew their entire newspaper towards the more weird news because that was getting more traffic than anything else. Um, they can't possibly be the only guys that have made that decision, um, in my opinion. Uh, the only other news organization that I can think of that's kind of gone that route but not really would be Afton Post in Norway. But they live in Norway and people are a little crazy up there because it doesn't, sun's not out too much during the winter and it makes them go a little nutty. So uh, I don't think they're trying to find weird news up there. I think they just have it. I mean, they, they, it's, it's, an, it's an odd, fun little country. Uh, oh, by the way, too, if anybody at any time has any questions, feel free to stop me. I'm more just up here rambling than anything else. You're not going to break my concentration or anything. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talking about the Russian FARC? No, oh, different one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Pravda, yeah, Pravda sometimes. I, Pravda had a funny conversation. I, I actually went and visited those guys a few years ago, and we were sitting around, and they said that they had noticed not only the weird news thing, but even the shit they completely make up, like aliens landing or, you know, strange ghosts walking around in the street. They just write those and post them occasionally. They say like, that gets more traffic than anything that, uh, that they ever post, too. And they're just kind of confused by it as well. But, of course, in Russia, apparently it's okay to just make shit up, and <laughs> no, one, no one will call you on it. One of the one of the interesting things that I've been seeing uh, that I did not know existed before is the, the what I call the pattern of story dispersion in the media, where something actually occurs and then how does it get to the media, and then once it gets to the media, how does it thrive and how does it move on? Um, as far as how does it get to the media, that's a very interesting thing. Um, there are a couple ways. Basically, rarely does a story reach the media that they weren't tipped off about. Rarely. Um, the story uh, that comes to mind was this past Christmas where the, uh, the parents were upset at the behavior of their children, so they went and moved out on the front lawn for a while. Now, how the media found out about that, either somebody's living in the neighborhood or they called specifically to try to draw attention to themselves, uh, it, it's hard to say. But the other way that things get into the media is, is that they will send press releases with bullshit studies. And every single one of you in this room has seen several and probably not even known it. Um, a good example of one that keeps coming back around year after year, because I think the same guys keep think sending the same press release out, is the one about how Germans have smaller penises. Have you guys seen that one? They, they talk about how condom manufacturers are frustrated because they have to make them in a smaller size for Germany. Every time that sucker comes around, it's like almost on a yearly basis. I always wondered, 
who the hell actually ran that study? I find it really suspect is what it boils down to. That doesn't like, seem like it makes a lot of sense. Another story that really tipped off my BS meter was one that came out uh, about a year or two ago just saying that uh, some scientists had discovered that 90% of all the large fishes in the sea had been extinct. But how the hell do they know that? Did he go count them? Did they know how many there were before? Did they know how many there are now? You know, it, it, there were just so many things wrong with it, but the AP had picked this thing up verbatim and just ran it. And it's, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, from talking to some of the media guys, it's plausible deniability. They can run this stuff because they, it, they, it's, it's not their fault, they're, they're not their responsibility, rather, to get this right. They can say, well, this Yahoo over here says the following and run it, and then it'll just go. But it's not their fault if he's wrong. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. But it's basically plausible deniability for them. One of the other things that I, I see floating around out there is the media eats itself, or more to the uh, more to the point, copies itself like crazy. We've been noticing this on FARC for a long time. It started uh, around 2000 or so when uh, one of the DJs that was reading FARC told me that Clear Channel had circulated a memo to all of its DJs telling them to go to FARC to get all their news. Uh, it's been a long damn time since I've met a radio guy that hadn't heard of what FARC was and used it on a regular basis. That, that's great as far as I'm concerned. It's a lot of fun. But... All, some interesting patterns started showing up as FARC grew in popularity where you could see a, a, a link that would get posted on FARC that would come through and we would stick it up you know, out of somebody's you know, local newspaper or whatever and then overnight it would just explode, show up everywhere on most of the radio stations, you, in most cases the next day because I'm not getting up early enough for the East Coast guys to, to use us as material. And uh, then over the next course, the next few days, then you get CNN on top of it and then eventually you'd see it would end with uh, either NPR running an article on it or showing up on The Daily Show where they actually go interview the guys. Um, now, the first time I told that to somebody, people were like, oh, come on, there's no way in hell. Well, I, I, at the time, I had no evidence, so I had to say, well, you know, okay, fine, it's just what I think is going on. But after a while, we started doing uh, fake stories to see where they would go <laughs> to give us some idea of what kind of impact we would have. Oh, absolutely, for science. Absolutely the name of science. It was all to find out what was happening. Uh, and I don't remember what the first one was, but we ended up hooking up with a bunch of guys uh, who run a little outfit called the Hoosier Gazette. They live in uh, Corydon, Indiana, across the river from Louisville. Uh, one of the guys is a teacher at a community college. One of the guys works at UPS hauling crates around all day long. I mean, not, not the people you would think would be capable of perpetrating, you know, media hoaxes, but these guys were able to do it with frightening regularity. And about the fourth or fifth time the media outlets got burned, they finally, you know, just decided to go ahead and never print anything these guys did. Uh, some of their stories where there was an article about uh, a kid named, I don't, I don't remember what the guy's name was, it was like Jason Smith or something like that, so that supposedly got picked up by Purdue on a basketball scholarship, uh, but that uh, there was an administrative error that occurred, and they ended up getting, a, instead of a six foot six uh, shooting guard, they ended up with a five foot six computer science major instead who wasn't willing to release the scholarship because he said he couldn't afford to go to school otherwise. <clears throat> that incidentally ended up getting picked up by uh, Jim Rome's radio show, and he actually broke his show with a, as a breaking news. Then throughout the course of the hour of his show, he said, well, we're going to check on this one. And then in the middle of it, they're, well, this may not appear to be true at all. And then by the end of the show, he was telling everybody that, oh, yeah, we knew it all along. We were just seeing if anybody was paying attention, which I didn't hear the show, but people who did told me there's no way in hell that was the case. Uh, another one that they did was they did one where there's a, a movie theater manager that dressed up as Satan for the uh, the premiere of uh, Jesus Christ Chainsaw Massacre. Or, oh, sorry, the uh, what was the real name of that movie? The Passion, whatever that was. Uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> Certain things have kind of like erased themselves from my mind. That's all I can think of when I see that movie is Jesus Christ Chainsaw Massacre because it's essentially what it is. Um, yeah, just about. The, uh, that was that one, and there were a few others, basically. But... Um, so we ended up, uh, when, once the Hoosier Gazette ended up being found out uh, and no one was ever going to buy a story from them again, I ended up hooking up with a couple other friends of mine. One was um, uh, Joe, who's one of the guys that runs uh, Zug.com. It's a prank site that's been around forever. I remember reading that a long time ago, back in 1999. One of my favorite pranks that they ever did was they, uh, what they had noticed the fine print on the back of the potato chip bag, when the Alastra one said that it may cause anal bleeding. So they decided to see exactly how many Alestra potato chips you would need to eat in order to incur anal bleeding. Was it common? Was it a, was it a rare side effect? And it turned out it took five days. <laughs> the, the prank's still up on the website if you want to check it out. It is a little, a little disgusting. But they, uh, 
the two guys, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, Joe and then my uh, other friend, Brian Doty, who runs a site called Broken News, which uh, occasionally will pop up under the satire heading rather than because usually the satire stuff is pretty obvious. But they got together and they decided that it seemed pretty easy to fake the media. So what if they actually tried? And so they did. They ended up, uh, the first one that they did, they put it together, a uh, website, and they actually called it, and I think it's still up. Let's see if I can find it here. They called it, uh, you, you would think that the, uh, the moniker WTF TV would tip people off, <laughs> but you'd be wrong. I don't know if it's still there or not. Yeah, here it is. This is their fake news site. <laughs> they see uh, 15 fans, four police officers injured after a brawl with Kenny Rogers' bodyguard. This entire website is fake. This whole thing. They did it based on a, around a city called Hazleton. They made fake ads. There are actually other fake articles, current weather conditions. And the reason that they uh, this worked, one of the reasons this worked, was because, I don't know if you're, you, you probably have noticed, that of all of the other local TV news sites out there, they all pretty much have the exact same look and feel. Well, there's a reason for that. It's because the same company does them all. There's, I Actually, I forget the name of them, but they run like 95 to 100 different television websites around the country, and in some cases, the same different affiliates in the same market. Uh, where they'll be running the CBS and the ABC affiliate at the same time. And the pages look almost exactly the same. I, I attended a presentation with these guys where they try to say, what, they're really different. Anybody can tell. No, they can't, uh, as evidenced by this. Um, so, I, and, and then the second one they did was actually one of my favorites. was the one where they had announced that uh, California, to combat obesity, uh, had decided to start sterilizing fat people. <laughs> And they wrote it up as a uh, medical journal article. I actually checked earlier, and it's down. But uh, that sucker went out everywhere. And they've got a little track, basically. The Wall Street Journal wrote an editorial against it, and uh, all kinds of stuff. These things went around. Now, what, what actually all of these things have in common, though, um, the, these successful media hoaxes have in common, there's actually just a few things. One, the, the stuff that Doty and Joe did here is because it looks like it's real. The second thing that they all did, they all have in common, is that they use real people's names and real places. Uh, oh, and another, yeah, speaking of one, the, the last one the Hoosier Gazette did that got out of the gate was the one where they had an Indiana congressman file a bill to change uh, the uh, numbering for I-69 to a more moral number. Uh, and uh, that shut their office down for a week. <laughs> With people, uh, but it, interestingly, they talked to the staffer afterwards all over, and he said he was shocked at how many people were actually in favor of it. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, but uh, and, and, and the reason that they used that, that it was successful because of using real names of people, places, and things is because the, the the real regular media does do research on these stories, and what they do is they find the names of the people involved and they Google them. Oh, this person exists. Great. Okay. Are they at this university? Yep, sure are. All right, run it. And that's it, honest to God. And that's why this stuff works. And Doty's basically, his whole argument against doing the, or for doing this in every single case is trying to point out the fact that the media doesn't do any fact-checking at all. In fact, I've done probably 50 to 100 newspaper and magazine ads, and only once have I been called by a fact-checker to double-check to make sure that what they wrote down was correct. Only once. So... That kind of exposes some interesting things about the media. Basically, what they're doing is you have a whole bunch of people that are sitting around that need to produce stuff. They've got to write articles about something, and if there's nothing to do, they've got to go find it one way or the other. And in that kind of an environment where you, you just can't sit around and wait for something to happen, you have to make stuff, and it's a lot easier in a day when you don't feel like going out to just basically hit FARC, run down the site, see what seems to be getting a lot of traffic, and then call those people. Uh, and that isn't the only thing that they do. I mean, basically, they also sit on top of uh, AP news feeds and, and basically copy those verbatim as well. Um, apparently, there's been several lawsuits between the Associated Press and CNN about this because CNN uh, apparently is somewhat guilty of it, too. They tell me. I don't know. I've, I've done no research on this myself. Uh, but uh, it, it's one of those things where you would think that it would be a little, there would be a little more to it than that, but in general, there's not. Um, a good example of stories that uh, will continue to copy themselves um, are uh, the shark attacks. That uh, Actually, we're just about into shark attack season now. I don't know if you guys are aware of that or not, but uh, any day now, there should be one. And then for the next couple months, any time a shark shows up on a beach, it's going to end up being in the newspaper. Um, for a while there, they were doing uh, old people driving into farmer's markets. Uh, for some reason, there was a real uh, rush on those. My suspicion on that, by the way, too, uh, the farmer's market thing anyways, is that I think it happens a lot. I, I, think, it, and I think that's why it started showing up. The reason that it started, they started publicizing it all the time, though, is because for whatever reason, there was this uh, groundswell of people focusing on these, these incidents occurring. Uh, probably the, uh, what I call the Florida effect, 
where uh, certain certain articles like say shark attacks and senior citizens driving into farmers market tend to have a little more play than they would maybe outside of that state. <clears throat> the uh, but one of the more annoying uh, examples of that kind of thing is plane crashes. Um, I don't know if anybody here's got a Total Fark account or not, but um, on Total Fark you can see the news as they come in. And generally, uh, when anything big happens, you know, because 100 news flash articles get submitted on the same thing immediately. Um, one of the more annoying things for me about the plane crashes is, is that since 9-11, any time any plane of any size crashes anywhere, it's it's big deal. Everybody gets really, really excited about it. News flashes come in, like some prop plane crashed in the middle of field out in Iowa somewhere. And that's one of those things that the media hasn't gotten over yet. They, uh, they're, they're still kind of fixated on that for some reason. But it turns out that although journalists aren't necessarily taught that there are certain types of stories that you can always go to, there's, there's this kind of this understanding amongst all of them that there are certain stories that will always get play. Like the human interest stories, like around Christmas time, where you got the family that had the house burned down, that always flies. Or, uh, you know, let's say the, the small child in your community that may be raising money for cancer by selling toys at the hospital, or whatever. I mean, every single community has these things and they cycle back around all the time. And it, it's interesting that they, they continue to do this. Um, a lot of people have pointed out that, or have, are, are claiming that it's because there's this liberal bias in the media. As far as I can tell, with the exception of Fox News, there's not really any political bias per se. I don't see anybody trying real hard to have a liberal bias. But what I do see is a lazy and a stupid bias. And <clears throat> I'll give you an example of that. Um, the, there was an article that I saw uh, right around the time of the election, which was really interesting, um, that was flipping back and forth when they were doing the polls, and the polls were getting all kinds of strange results, where right towards the end, some days Kerry was winning, some days Bush was winning, you never could tell. And I started to notice that whenever they were discussing poll numbers, whenever they were talking about uh, Kerry being in the lead, they'd say, he's got a lead of three percentage points, and they just kind of drop it as that. Whenever Bush was in the lead, they'd go, Bush has a lead of three percentage points, well within the margin of error. That was always tacked on to the end of it, and I thought, well, that's really kind of bizarre. What, you know, as if the margin of error, which, yeah, okay, the margin of error is plus or minus three percentage points, but it's almost never three. I mean, I don't know if you guys know anything about math and standard deviations, but, I mean, the odds of that actually occurring are slim to none. But it was, it was an interesting caveat that kept on getting thrown in that I would see occasionally from some news channels where, in a time, there was some bad news out of a particular candidate. With Fox, it's obvious because they're not trying to hide it, but with the other ones, it was more... They would, there would be some bad news about a candidate that the newscaster supported, and then they would then finish their story by trying to mitigate the damage, like, oh, it's well within the margin of error, or they don't really need that state, had no chance to win in the first place, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. Um, and, and I call that the lazy bias, because I don't believe that any of these people were actually trying to do that on purpose. I really don't. I don't think that there are very many media guys out there that are trying to show for their own candidates. I think they go out of their way to not do that, but I think that after a while, some of this just kind of creeps in on its own anyhow. Um, as far as the uh, the copying of the articles go, though, there's some really interesting... Th none of these guys are actually supposed to do this. It's illegal, as it turns out. In fact, I talked to uh, one uh, Farker who works, uh, or works, because she, she switched jobs for Westwood One Radio out in Los Angeles and was talking about how they actually had an idiot come down from on high never even mention any AP article at all, period. If you see it in the AP, find it from some other news source, but don't do it because there have been so many lawsuits over them using AP articles because you guys may not be aware, but radio stations are not allowed to read stories on the air without giving proper attribution. They do it. Uh, that's part of the reason why clipping services exist, uh, where basically what clipping services are doing is essentially kind of like what we're doing. Uh, they take the news, they rewrite it, and then they send it on. That's actually illegal because news is not something you can actually copyright or, or trademark. Uh, if it actually occurred, then it, uh, then it, it can be talked about by somebody else. There's an interesting court case before uh, coming up to the Supreme Court, I think. I, I forget which. My, my mind's not really good on the details here. Over fantasy baseball. Um, Major League Baseball sold the exclusive rights to fantasy baseball to an outfit. Uh, I forget how many millions of dollars they did. And there's been a lawsuit going on saying you can't do that because you can't sell statistics on sports. Like, they can't sell the sole right to cover the story. They can do the immediate broadcast rights, but they can't prevent other newspapers from saying, you know, yesterday the Yankees lost to the Red Sox. You can't do that. And they're basically now fighting over the details of whether or not you can do that for baseball statistics or not. Um, it's also going on in uh, England over uh, fantasy football, soccer there. Uh, the same kind of uh, 
situation going on. They end up, but but a lot of these statistics and whatever are actually copied from the bottom from other news sources. It's something they're kind of dancing around in the actual court case, but that's most of the time where it comes from. Because I guarantee you, there's not every news outlet in the United States that's got a guy sitting in every ballpark in America counting the number of pitches and walks and whatever, and then basically doing the calculations there. They're just reading it off of the AP news feed or ESPN or somewhere and then copying it. Um, we ended up uh, coming across this situation occurring on FARC on a pretty early basis. And just for the record, I don't really care if people copy stuff off FARC. I don't care if they find new stories on FARC. We don't own them. It's not our deal. What I do care about is when they start like reading it word for word or going into the comments and pulling out all the good jokes and using them in, say, Jay Leno's monologues, which has been happening with frighteningly regular basis lately, uh, to the point where we've actually started keeping a little file. When it gets up to about 100, we're going to call those guys and see what they uh, got going on. But at any rate... Uh, Early on uh, in uh, FARC's history, right around 9-11, nothing funny was going on for about a week. And after a while, this got to be really tedious. And so on the Sunday after 9-11, I put up a little thing on the website and said, basically, you know, we need to get something funny going on here. Since the media isn't coming up with any funny news articles, why don't you go back into the archives and find what you think are the best stories that you ever saw on FARC, and we'll just run those again. So we did. One of the stories in particular was a 18-month old article from, of all places, the Lexington Herald Leader, which is my hometown newspaper, about the correlation between creativity and people being crazy. Uh, basically talking about how people that have, uh, they've been having problems with people getting on Prozac and other depression medications and then losing their ability to create. Uh, interestingly enough, I've run into a couple uh, artists who are very successful, um, Dale Chihuly actually being one of them, I don't know who he is or not, but not important, who when he's on his medication, he can't function. I mean, he can function as a human being, he can't create anything. It totally saps it away. Uh, he has to actually go off his medication for a while in order to actually do stuff, and so he just kind of does that whenever he gets a, gets a chance. Um, so we put this thing we put this thing up online, and Ananova ran it as breaking news. So I contacted him and I said, "Hey, uh, you guys uh, got that off our website, you know, and that's that's cool and all, but I would really appreciate some return traffic because I, I'd run the I'd run the stats on our database, and the time we had sent them almost a million page views." Uh, just in the year and a half since we've been tracking the stats at all, and I figured, you know, hey, just you know, give us if you're getting so much of your stuff from us, just you know, mention us once in a while. That'd be great. Uh, and they're like, no, we didn't. That that came through our newswire. <laughs> An 18-month-old article from my local newspaper just came through your newswire as 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 a newsflash. And so that that's the that's the uh, long version of why we don't like Dan and Nova anymore because they don't like the us and screw them basically. But um, you see that you know, stuff like that, though, happens all the time. Um, like I said, radio stations do it on a pretty regular basis. Um, one of the more uh, strange times of my life where I actually picked up on that was I was driving across uh, Indiana once, heading back to my uh, wife's uh, parents' place in Iowa. And I was going through listening to the Bob and Tom show one morning, and they ran an article that they had seen in uh, Afton Poston, which had been on our website. And I felt fairly positive that Bob and Tom did not have a guy reading Norway's state newspaper trying to find uh, stories. So I, I wrote him and I said, hey, are you guys using FARC as a, as a source for your material? And the guy that wrote back is like, no, nah, I don't think so. He's like, I'll ask around. And about three days later, I wrote back. He's like, yeah, actually we are. Is that OK? And I said, yeah, that's fine. It'd just be nice if you mentioned this once in a while. Well, they didn't for about two years. But eventually, they had me on a couple of times. So it was, it was OK. Um, but at any rate, uh, it, it's one of those things that uh, you could argue that it's just another sign of how the media is degrading, except that uh, the copying of the stories and also basically the just kind of filling in the blanks with you know BS stories and whatnot, except that there are actually historical records that are very similar. For example, the uh, Hindenburg disaster, uh, the initial news reports from that are full of all kinds of inconsistencies because they basically didn't have the information and they, and they wrote out. In fact, the real cause of the Hindenburg disaster was only publicized recently and it had nothing to do with what they originally thought it was. Um, I, w I won't go into the details of it, but it's, it's, it's fairly interesting. Somebody talked to me in the bar about this later on. And this isn't one of those tinfoil hat things. It was a PBS special I saw. It was really cool. Uh, the short version is they coated the outside of the Hindenburg with rocket fuel. No kidding. They didn't know it was rocket fuel. They just found out the hard way. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Titanic disaster was the same way. Um, there was a lot of uh, misinformation that came out around that at around the same time. And you could actually see the misinformation go from the New York Times to the smaller town newspapers as it's copied verbatim over and over and over again. Um, I, 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 again, have done no studies on this, but I'm fairly positive that, you know, you could go back in time 150 years to Kansas City, and the local newspaper editor would open up the copy of the New York Times that he got sent to him every day, which, you know, wouldn't arrive for about two weeks, and it just start going down through there. 
cut some stuff up with the scissors and reprint it. I, I think it's something that's been going on since the beginning of time. And it's one of those things that's just, you know, easier to do. But it was interesting to me to see how prevalent it is. Uh, essentially, there are only, as far as I can tell, about three sources of media, uh, that, of news stuff. AP, Reuters, and then local newspapers. And by local, I mean like ground level stuff, like something that happened in the community that you wouldn't have otherwise come across. Uh, and in general, anything that makes it into the AP, even if it's wrong, even if it's obviously wrong, will get printed. And it's, it goes back to plausible deniability again. It's one of those things where they can say, well, you know, we picked it up off the AP. We didn't know it was wrong. They're supposed to be checking that stuff. And generally, AP is pretty good about getting stuff right. But it's one of those things where newspapers that know better that have AP feeds will just pass this stuff on because they know that there's, there's absolutely no retribution for them whatsoever. Yes? Oh, are they? Oh, sure, yeah. Oh, good. Yep. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And that goes into something that I'm kind of moving in the direction of talking about the, the, uh, the future of media and how that's going to go. That's, that's essentially what seems to me to be the breakdown of the way things are headed. Media is basically going to have to decide what it is. Uh, back in the day, you had... Your local newspaper would have been the local source for basically all your straight-up news. Maybe your TV station would have been too, or it would have been a network television that would be the uh, the main source of all hard news. Now what's happening is, is that with you know 3,000 media sites out on the internet, basically all saying the same thing, they are going to have to differentiate in order to be able to survive. And in order to do that, they're going to have to frame their news one way or the other. They can either take the high road, be like CNN, say, well, we're just going to report news and that's it, or go the political route like Fox and basically filter all their stuff through a, a, a conservative or a liberal viewpoint. Or, uh, in my opinion, the third thing, which is what's happening with The Daily Show. Um, I think it's either a matter of time before either The Daily Show morphs into a news network or uh, they create one that looks very similar, but it's, it's the same thing. It's filtering it through a humor filter rather than through anything else. And, and when you're talking about what the AP is doing there with the same story, that seems to be kind of the conclusion that they've reached as well that they realize that they're going to have to send that out and, and flavor it depending on who it is that they're going to be buying that thing from. That, that's going to be a real pain in the ass for me, though, because that just means that every article that I get you have to see 2,000 times a day anyway is going to come in 6,000 times a day. Great. <clears throat> Speaking of AP, interestingly enough, one of the things that we've been working on, we're actually getting an AP news feed for FARC. Since it occurred to me, I saw all the traffic we've been sending to Yahoo over the years for the AP feeds, and I'm just like, well, Christ, we should just do that ourselves. This isn't that expensive, and so we're, we're hooking it up. Turns out the problem is, is that the way they have the uh, AP feed set up, if you're running it on Windows boxes, they've got like a plug-and-play thing where they just give it to you and it runs. If you don't, then you have to build it yourself, and that's been kind of the holdup. They, uh, they, they say that they have a lot of new sites out there that do that, but you know, they, they read their own thing, and so they haven't really come up with anything that, that you can just drop in and use. So that's their big holdup on that. But that'll be interesting to see how that goes. I already talked about the, uh, the fake research and statistics. Uh, like I said, you can, there's, there's a whole bunch of other ones out there, too. I mean, it, it's kind of like it sits on the level of like an uber urban legend. Not necessarily like, because the urban legends are fairly obvious eventually, but the uber ones I'm talking about are stuff like the... Uh, the one about where back in the uh, dot-com boom, uh, WorldCom was claiming that internet traffic was doubling every 100 days. Well, they just repeated it because, you know, no one's checking that kind of stuff. It turned out to be completely bogus. They are basically using it to inflate their stock value by hyping the fact that we're an internet company. We're going to be really big. Look at us grow. Our stock value should double every 100 days is what they were really saying. Um, but it was just one of those things, again, like I said, where if somebody else says it, the media's got plausible deniability. They can just go ahead and run it. It's no big deal. Um, there are other examples too, like saying nine one. There were nine eleven families that were supposedly suing Iraq for one hundred sixteen trillion dollars or whatever. They uh, had uh, had basically made a mistake and they had added three zeros by accident. Um, and again, no one ever picked it up. They didn't really care. No, excuse my uh, lack of organization here. This is pretty much how I operate, anyways. <clears throat> Yeah, speaking of the future of news organizations, this is something else that I found kind of interesting. The local newspapers, I don't know if you guys are aware, um, I, I actually, somebody made a crack at a local new, a news conference that I went to. Um, they, were, they, they jokingly referred to FARC as a parasite. Um, it, it, was, it was an obvious joke. The guy looked at me and smiled when he did, and everybody in the room laughed because they knew I was sitting in there. Uh, where, you know, basically they're claiming that we're living off of the, the content that other people are creating. And I've actually had people come up and say, well, FARC doesn't have any content in itself. You know, I'm not necessarily going to dispute that. But 
I, it, it's interesting to point out to people the other organizations that live in that same niche, and one of those is your local newspaper, without a doubt. And I'm talking even at the Cleveland level. The newspapers here are doing AP, Reuters, or Knight Ritter news coming in nationally, occasionally writing something that goes back the other direction, but not often. Uh, most people's local newspapers have staffs that only write local sports, high school stuff, maybe college if you have a college team in your town, and movie reviews and uh, restaurant openings. That's it. And if you think about it, next time you open your newspaper, check it out. Look at the bylines. If you ever see, like, Larry Smith and the AP, well, that and the AP is 90% of the article. Larry Smith may have tweaked a couple words or added a couple, like, extra paragraphs in there. But it, it's interesting that uh, they were they were referring to FARC as being a parasitic entity when, in, in, in fact, most of the news organizations out there function exactly the same way. Um, it, it, it's one of those things most people aren't aware of, and it's, one of the, it's been kind of gradually happening because back in the day, when these newspapers got going 100 years ago, they did have staffs that went out and found this stuff firsthand and did it, or at least you know copied out of the New York Times or whatever they did. Um, but it's very interesting to see that uh, the, the newspapers are kind of having an interesting conundrum now because their circulations are dropping. People ages 18 to 35 are not buying subscriptions. It's not that people are canceling them. Well, the people are canceling. They're dying. As the older folks die, those, those canceled subscriptions are not getting picked up by people our age. They're just basically dropping off the face of the planet. And this is some cause of concern for the newspapers, obviously. Uh, they really don't know how to reverse it. They've come up with some pretty bizarre ideas. Um, one of the things they threw out pretty quickly back in the early days was is that, they, that a lot of newspapers experimented with forcing you to go through their front page to get to their news. They basically blocked all deep linking. Uh, the idea was based off the, uh, there's actually some like newspaper theory type concepts, one of which be, is uh, send everybody through the front page and then shoot them through the first section to the back uh, to read. And you guys have probably noticed this. I mean, like the front page of any newspaper has got four or five articles and then it'll be cut in half and say, continue on page A9 or whatever. The reason they do that is they want you to cycle past the ads repeatedly over and over again. It's ad exposure, basically. It's, it's page views, literally. Yeah, as you cycle through the newspaper, you go read your one article, you go back to the front, you say, oh, there's another one. You go back through it again, you go buy all those ads a second time, and so on and so forth. They, uh, they ended up quit stopping doing that, though, because newspapers that switched to that format quickly lost all of their traffic. Turns out people don't read newspapers on the Internet like that. Who to, who to none? They, people tend to jump in and out on specific pages. It's something that most of the newspapers have kind of come uh, accustomed to, including the ones that require registration. Which brings me to the second uh, failed concept of newspapers, which is the registration thing. Even regi even newspapers that do registration, uh, the employees that work for them have told me that they don't think it's a really good idea either. Most of them have opened it up so that they can allow Google News, or in some cases us, actually, to go through. Um, I have not been able to get a hold of anybody over at the New York Times. We have been not linking them so long, they don't realize that we can generate any traffic, so I'm not getting any any love over there when I call up and tell them, hi, we're this new site you've never heard of. You should come let us link to you guys, and no one ever writes back. Uh, what, they all realize that that's not working. In fact, uh, I've seen a couple articles go through on Wired Magazine talking about how it's, it, it, it's it looking to be the case that the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal are effectively writing themselves off of the Internet. Because when you do searches for news articles, their articles don't come up at all. If you do, and, and in fact, that is one of the major reasons why Bloomberg and CBS Market Watch and all those other financial websites have succeeded. It's because the Wall Street Journal let them. It's because there you couldn't get to them on the internet, and as a result, they ended up uh, kind of reducing themselves in relevance as far as internet searches were concerned. They don't necessarily care about this. I mean, there's there's a certain ivory tower mentality that exists among newspaper editors anyway, and by all rights, it, it, they're they're not wrong. Uh, good example uh, is uh, you've got situations where you know the people running newspapers in general came up through the organization from start to finish, from the bottom to the top, and they've been doing the same thing the same way for 70 years, and it's one of these ain't broke, don't fix it type situations, except now they're starting to realize that things actually are broken. Uh, interestingly, I was had the fortune to be at a newspaper conference about two years ago and attended a conference on how to set up your newspaper site for registration, which was of great interest to me, so I decided to go down and check it out because I think it's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. And as it turns out, the major motivation for newspaper sites to have registration in the first place is so they can harvest your emails and sell them to spammers. No shit. They actually came out and said this in the conference. One of the guys asked the question to the person who was talking about how easy it was and how it's a good idea and how your traffic doesn't drop when you require registration. They said, so they said, well, you know, what is the value in this? And they said, well, you can sell them to the, the spammers for a quarter a pop. And the guy said, well, how do you prevent people who don't want to be spammed to 
from having that happen. And they're like, well, we make it very obvious when you sign up on your news site that you can click here and be opted out of all mass emails. And we honor that. We're, we're good guys. We'll, we, won't, we won't sell their addresses. And then the same guy I asked him, he says, well, okay, so then if you have an opt out and if you make it really obvious, what is the value to you as a site that requires registration of a customer that opts out from bulk mailing? And the guy said, none. No value. And in fact, they would prefer that those people don't read the newspaper. And I was like, huh, okay. That was a really interesting insight. The good news is it does seem like the registration is going where, at the very least, the, main, the other thing that they, they want registration for is they're trying to collect information on people for their local markets, for their local advertising. And that's why you're seeing websites do what they've been doing for Google News. Um, and, and for us, in some certain situations, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, for example, allows traffic in from FARC. So does the uh, Scotsman up in Ed Edinburgh. And the way they do it is they just they detect the traffic as it comes in. If it's coming in from off-site, they allow it. If it's coming in from one of their other pages, they block it. Or, in some cases, uh, the Miami Herald, I think, does this, but the page behaves strangely on different days. They'll let you hit it out from outside the first time, and then never again. You have to re register if you want to try to read that article twice. It actually sticks a cookie on your machine that blocks you from that point forward. I'm not really sure why that is. I'm not, I don't know what the value is there. It's some, somebody's idea that got passed around at a meeting or something. I have no clue. So, Anyways, uh, so things that I've learned since I uh, started running FARC. Um, corporations own politicians lock, stock, and barrel. That's one thing. Probably comes as no surprise to anybody, but in general, it, it, it's, it's pretty much the case. Um, there was an excellent talk in here uh, at the uh, 3 o'clock hour discussing that, that very issue, talking about how they're getting their own laws passed to prevent them from having to send out information that may be damaging to them, among other things. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you missed it. So, yes. As far as, yeah, it does, um, but not for the reasons that I uh, expected it would in the first place. I did it because there were some people that were begging for more links on FARC, uh, more than they already, you know, 75 to 100 we put up there anyway, which I think is excessive myself. Uh, but, you know, there are people who are news hounds and they've got to be, you know, reading stuff. They're the guys that, like, pull up the AP feed on Yahoo and just read it top to bottom, which is you know, mind-boggling for me. But um, so I figured, you know, there's somebody told me they would pay for it. I'm like, well, all right, sounds good. So we'll just go ahead and set this thing up and let people do it. What's happened since is, is that the vast majority of people that have signed up for it either do it because they like the site and they never read it, or they signed up for the community that exists inside there, which is really reminiscent of the way that FARC was back in the early days, which was kind of surprising. That's, that's a whole other discussion on the way the communities evolved, but it's, it's very surprising to me that that was possible to get back. It was kind of shocking. Um, something else I've learned is uh, it's either really hard to write good satire or the onion has just ruined everybody. Uh, I'm not sure which it is exactly. I, I think the Onion kind of cops out on a bunch of stuff. Speaking of people that have their set format for newspapers, I mean, it seems like when they run out of stuff to do, they either do Area Man eats the entire goddamn bag of chips and, you know, a thousand iterations on the same and write an entire article about it or whatnot. I have a theory on online uh, media satire, and that is if you, I can tell what the entire article is about by reading the tagline, then I'm not going to read it. I'm not. Uh, and a good example of, uh, of something that is not like that was an article that I read about three years ago, I think. It was talking about uh, how rioters in L.A. were uh, preparing for the uh, eventual champion world championship that they were going to get. It was one of the years where they were, they were definitely going to get it. And that seemed kind of interesting. So I, I went to check it out, see what they're doing, you know, stuff like their moms were packing them lunches and they were picking out their best bricks and, you know, checking for, you know, heaving distance and whatnot, marking up targets to set fire to later on, you know. It, it was a really good article. It was one of those, like, you couldn't tell what the article was about by just reading the tagline, and it seems like too many people have kind of lost sight of that. That's, that's just my own opinion, though. People like pictures. Uh, you put the words with a pic on a FARC tagline, and it'll get five times a hit. No matter what the article's about, um, really helps with astronomy articles because nobody really gives a shit about astronomy, let's face it. But you put a with pic on there, like, they just discovered a new planet, and we've got a picture of it. Oh, well, hell, i got to check that out. <laughs> got to see what that looks like. I mean, it's the same with the boobs, obviously, but it's a little bit, you know, a little bit, you know, <laughs> lower down on the scale. For the boobies? That's that's kind of hard. It's almost random, honestly. Um, the the main things that we're looking for are uh, I don't like porn. It sounds strange, but I don't. Nudity, woohoo! Let's do it. But you know, porn, I, I got a real problem with it. What's that? Yes. 
That's the first one. The second one is is that it's got to have like no, obviously no viruses, trojans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We've had an interesting problem crop up in the last year. Actually, is that uh, where we it's bait and switch. We'll find a site that we think is pretty cool, post it, and they'll notice the traffic, and then they'll stick like every high paying ad in the in the world up there, and viruses and trojans and all kinds of crap. So uh, that's one of the reasons why people have been complaining there haven't been that many of those links, and the reason is because we can't find that many good ones anymore. They just get end up getting co opted and, and and wiped out. But there's yeah, so basically stuff that's you know not intrusive, you know. Mostly attractive checks, except for with the exception of the one we posted Monday, which is the world's worst boob job. I don't know if anybody saw it or not, but oh my god, what the fuck is wrong with people? So it, 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 it's almost random though. After that, I mean, you, there's usually like you know five or ten good ones in a given day, and you can pick from that. Um, other things I've learned: somebody in the world somewhere every week gets their penis cut off, usually by their wife or girlfriend, sometimes by themselves. Uh, sometimes by farm implements. It happens with a pretty frightening regular basis. It's right up there with a uh, you know, semi-tractor trailer full of food overturning on the highway nonstop. Uh, that one doesn't surprise me too much. I mean, there's enough accidents. I mean, most tractor trailers are carrying something. It's probably going to be food if it's going to be anything. Uh, other things that I've learned is that uh, small independent websites have a lot of power. And uh, I don't really necessarily include ourselves on that, uh, but it's... Uh, on the, on the level of the FARC and slash dots, uh, we can actually crash out sites. There's only one website on the planet I can link to for video, and that's iFilm. That's it. No one else can take a hit. Uh, the occasional local news corporation can, but iFilm's the only one that can actually withstand a direct hit to a, to a link. And that kind of changes the ability of what you, what you can do. Um, it's gotten to the point now where I actually have iFilm's contact information, and whenever something happens that I need to have video to, I contact them. And a good example of that was a buddy called me up right in the middle of John Stewart's uh, famed appearance on Crossfire where he was calling them all a bunch of dicks. And uh, I, I, after watching that, that was absolutely hilarious. And so I contacted iFilm. I said, you guys got to find somebody who had that and put that thing up. And they did. And it was actually, it's been the most popular link they ever posted for them. Um, so uh, it, it, it's interesting with that, how that how that works. But also at the same time, you can do other things. Like, for example, we've, we've done some fundraising. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of giving to charities, but I don't like giving to, like, just regular charities. Like, uh, there's a bunch of bloggers out there that got together to fight breast cancer, female bloggers. And basically, if they made X amount of money, they'd just show their boobs. And I was like, well, all right, I can get behind this. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, there's Ernie from Ernie's House at whoop -Ass. He's got his thing called Let's Bring Him Home that he does every Christmas, where he was in the military. And it turns out if you're in the military and you've got leave over Christmas, and most of them do, you can afford to have your own plane ticket home, you can go home. But if you're in Afghanistan... Yeah, well, that's that's a little difficult, isn't it? It's a very expensive. Takes a lot of time. So he created a website to basically raise money to bring soldiers home over the holidays. And uh, I think he ended up getting I don't remember how many hundred it was this year. Uh, the, I remember the first year it was like twenty. But um, and so we we tried to help out by giving him a little bit more high profile thing. Um, one of the uh, charity organizations that popped up, which really fascinates me, is a guy who's actually on FARC all the time. Uh, runs a uh, website called Architecture for Humanity. I don't know if you guys have seen this or not. It's one of my absolute favorite charity organizations because what I think what they've done is fantastic. This guy created a little, he's an architect, and he created a kit that costs $200 that will convert a container, like that they use on container ships to haul freight around the globe, into a house. It basically consists of a tarp you put over top of it so you don't melt, and a little kit that transfers, makes the door easier to open on the front. And without, without having the heat directly on the metal, you can turn it, these things into housing no problem. They dropped off, I, I can't remember how many thousands of these things they dropped off out in the uh, Pacific Rim after the tsunami. He actually got called up by the UN the following day after that occurred, and they started sh shipping his stuff out. Uh, absolutely fantastic stuff. And it's stuff like that where, you know, it's something where if we can help point these guys out and let the media know they exist, it's, it's, it's the coolest thing ever for both them and us. But even then, going down to the more smaller uh, uh, smaller blogs even, too, it doesn't take a very big blog at all to be able to, you know, call the New York Times on some bogus information or, say, you know, find somebody's made up a uh, memo that's being used to slander, slander a particular candidate. Um, it's very interesting seeing that, that there's that level of checking going on. And it should be interesting to see whether or not that engenders uh, more uh, careful study of the articles that the newspapers are printing or whether or not they just ignore it completely and continue to do what they've done all along. I have a suspicion that's probably what's going what's to happen. Um, whether or not uh, the news media is changing on a whole is very interesting, too, as well. Like I mentioned before, they're doing a lot more in the uh, humor-related area of the this, this spectrum. Uh, somebody asked me uh, a while ago whether or not I was concerned that newspapers would prevent us from linking to them. And I don't think they will because basically our traffic is revenue. It's money. 
they love it. In fact, uh, newspapers compete on a regular basis to get their articles linked on us. I mentioned the CNN thing before. Uh, it's been several years now, but Fox News, USA Today, and ABC News all submit their own articles, as do a lot of local TV stations. Uh, what's really humorous is, I was thinking about citing examples, but then I thought I'd probably bust the guys that do this. But you should see some of the taglines that come out on some of these articles submitted by the websites themselves. Shocking. I mean, it's the ones they wish they could write that are just so off color, it's ridiculous. You know, and I'll look at that, I'll be like, did ABC just send that in with that tagline? Oh my God. So it's really, it's really kind of funny. It, it cracks me up. I can see the uh, submitter's email address, and it'll say at abcnews.com on the back of it. <laughs> so that's that's usually my first clue. Uh, actually, yes, it is. It is. We don't because, it's, like I said, some of the submitters are just like, "Whoa, oh my god!" <laughs> I mean, I, that happens to me on a regular basis. It definitely freaks me out. Speaking of which, too, um, this is probably a good time to show it. Um, and this is then I'll take questions right here. This right here is the queue. Mm, punch it up here again because it needs to be, needs to be refreshed. I have no idea how many articles are in this thing because I was. Since I've been talking, there's I, I cleared it out at about five o'clock or so. We'll see if it actually comes up or not. Otherwise, yep. <laughs> what are they going to do? Post more burbs to Fark? I mean, come on, who cares, man? So this is basically what I look at like every morning. You can see there's a news flash. That one right there. If you could read or not, it says "Man Weds Horse." So, in the queue, it's nowhere. This is stuff that just showed up. This is the stuff that people have been sending in like since we've been talking, and basically. Yeah, yeah. This is this is what's actually showed up in the last hour or so. You can see there's a total fuckers are talking themselves about what is this here? Total fuckers car had a bitch fit last night, and they're talking about it to console each other. Who've got bad cars and stuff like that. And basically, I just got out there here, and I'll I'll pick a couple. I'll I'll save man weds horse, even though it happened earlier today. That's uh, Princess Charles getting married to Camille, by the way. Uh, d d d. Brian Barton captures a legal alien. We'll hold that one back. This is a big ass comment, and they're still talking about the cars. So, anyway, so I'll just shoot down here. Abe, you go to on display at a museum. is actually an article we already ran with a different tagline on it. But, anyway, first pass is that. I'll shoot down there. I'll find the stuff I want to keep. And then it comes up the second one right here, where uh, two articles have come in since I started looking at it, including one classified ad. And then basically, here we can do all the edits. And this is where, if I need to like get in and tweak a tagline a little bit, uh, because of bad grammar, spelling, or whatnot, and that gets by us all the time, too. Uh, they could do it from here. Change the tagline from, say, obvious to stupid or, you know, from hero to unlikely or whatever and uh, get a lot of complaints from that. And then basically just uh, add, delete, or whatever. Uh, a couple of the options we have uh, are actually kind of interesting. People ask me how much time I spend on the website, and the answer is basically however much time I have. And the way I get away with this is, uh, I don't know how well you can see this now. Probably not too well at all, but <clears throat> there's a, the options we have here. I can add it immediately, which I almost never do. Uh, then there's one called add later, which will randomly add... Uh, 600 up to 640 minutes to the uh, distribution time, so it'll pop out later. Uh, then there's midnight, which will post it to midnight plus eight hours, up to eight hours later on. Uh, and then there's delete, knock it off total far completely or whatnot. The the advantage of this is is that if I get up in the morning and I gotta go, I gotta like get out of the house, I gotta go do something. Usually there's about 300 articles in the queue when I wake up. I can then pick like say 30 links out of this thing, and then send them all and add later. And so for the next eight hours, stuff will roll out without me being there. And so I can like go off and do the stuff for the rest of the afternoon and you know kick back and whatnot. And if we end up having a full day, I can push it out to, to midnight or whatnot. But the upshot of it is, is that I'm usually not there. If you have a total FARC account, you can actually see it in action. The links change color based on stuff that we've looked at already. If we've reviewed it, it's a different color. If it's going to go green light, it's not. And they can tell when I haven't been around for a long time. And like if it ends up being a case like 10 hours has gone by, they all start like freaking out. I start getting phone calls, actually. Like, where are you? You OK? So. Uh, but uh, that's basically what that looks like on the back end. Actually, I've only shown that to, uh, at one other talk I've given to, so that's what that's worth. Uh, any questions? I can talk for days, so hit me. Oh, um, well, we, we automatically reject anything that's got a matching URL, for starters, which causes some interesting problems, uh, mainly because uh, there are a lot of times where the uh, news articles are basically being printed on multiple websites simultaneously with different URLs, so obviously that doesn't block. At the same time, there are some local newspapers that don't change their uh, their uh, URLs in years, like you know local columnists, for example. Like Dave Barry for a while did that, where he didn't have a permanent link to hit his website. So if you tried to submit a Dave Barry article, it wasn't going because it had already been submitted back in 2000 and was continuing getting blocked. And I get some complaints about that. But at the same time, I can't keep uh, saying 
without having that in there because we're getting 2,000 a day blocking duplicate URLs. So God knows how many would be without it, especially during a newsflash type event where everybody tries to submit it all at the same time. Yes. It's really weird. <laughs> Not surprisingly, it really, it, like I said, I mean, and part of the part of the, the talk I've given here is it kind of maybe portrays the fact that it, it just shouldn't be like that, honestly. Um, something very wrong. Uh, I was talking to some guys. It isn't necessarily that we're creating the news. I was talking to some guys at CNN, and they said basically what they're on top of us looking for is they're trying to not figure out what should be news, but what people are finding interesting. I don't know if you can get the distinction there exactly, but that's basically what they're like. They're trying to make their stuff look more interesting, trying to do better lead stories as a result. Um, incidentally, the record for something appearing on FARC that wasn't a major news event showing up on a Fox News ticker is under 15 minutes right now. So it goes pretty quick. The, the first guy, Jeff, uh, was just a guy that we, we've been hanging out for forever. And, you know, at one point I was like, man, I can't keep up with all this shit. You want to do it? So that's how that came out. Uh, yeah, basically. So, but yeah, it, it was just, he was around. So it's kind of funny, too, because you can tell occasionally Jeff doesn't take his meds. And, whoo, man. I come back and it'd be stuff like, mother kills child with frying pan. You know, and you're just like, what the hell did you post that out there for? That's not even remotely funny. Good God. Um,. The the second guy Peter we got in there uh, basically because he seemed to, he seemed to have the knack for it and so we put him up there and tried it out. There's actually a third guy that we had for a while who was one of our top submitters and to save him embarrassment I won't tell you who he is. We basically had to un undo him because it turned out he was much better at submitting articles than he was picking them. Strangely, I wouldn't have thought so. And then the fourth guy was again one of our top submitters, but it turns out he was excellent at picking links and he's the one guy that when I'm gone people can't actually tell I'm not there. So and it's it's not that it's easy that easy to tell anyways, but it's one of those things where like when I, I the longest I've ever been away from the website completely was three weeks uh, when I went around Europe in uh, 2002 I think it was, and w at the time we were getting 3.7 million page views a week and it dropped 100,000 every week I was gone. The week I came back right back up to the same level again. It was weird. I was actually getting email towards the end of that corner. You okay? Something wrong with the website? Fark's just not as funny as it was anymore. What's going on? <laughs> So I, I, I don't really have any explanation for it. I'm not really sure what the hell the deal is. The only thing I ever point to when somebody asks me that is I can I just point to what John Cleese said about Monty Python, which is people asking him where they, why they're all funny. And he said, well, we don't know either. We're just trying to entertain ourselves. And that's essentially what we've been doing this thing the entire time. So basically that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, yeah, like, very, like, where would you go if you wanted to find a website that's got information that doesn't really clouded much by stuff? Uh, Stratfor, actually. Stratfor.org. Uh, I think it's .org. Yeah, those guys are a political think tank. They're not really a news organization. They get paid for being right. Uh, and as a result, they don't tend to let a lot of their articles color their, uh, be, co be colored by politics because then they're going to lose money. Um, and a good example of that is they had a fantastic article when they were discussing the, the root cause of 9-11 after the, uh, the, the report came out. And their conclusion was, they say people, some people blame Clinton, some people blame Bush, and their conclusion was it was both their fault in completely different ways. They were, for example, I like the way they debunked some of the things. They were talking about um, how, I forget the general it was that was talking about how the first day the Bush administration came in and they were, they made the first thing on their, on their agenda was talking about uh, Iraq and uh, what was going on there. Well, Stratford was talking about, and most people forget, but at the time we were dropping ordinance on Iraq every single day. I don't know if any, many people remember that or not, but during the Clinton administration, I mean, on, on a daily basis, we were shooting down planes and bombing shit, and you know. And so it, it was the only hot war the United States was involved in at the time at all, so of course that would be the first thing they would be talking about because that's what was going on. They, they weren't making an excuse for the Iraq war. They were just saying that there are other reasons why these things would have happened other than there was this, you know, this overriding goal from the outset to go out and invade Iraq, which, you know, it, it, was, it was very interesting to see them talk about the, you know, the, the more logical reasons why some of these things would have occurred than not. They also have some really interesting contacts inside uh, Central Asia. 
strangely enough. They've been talking with the, uh, the Kyrgyzstan and the uh, upcoming Kazakhstan uh, meltdown, which they're predicting is going to happen pretty soon. Uh, and their inside contacts there are pretty good. I, but it, I think they're easy to get in Central Asia. You just call some guy up and say, hey, you want 100 bucks? Tell me what's going on in those meetings. And I have a feeling that's how they get it. So, But uh, those guys are really interesting. Um, other than that, um, it, it's hard to say, really. Uh, I, I think that the AP probably, believe it or not, is probably as close as you're going to get. But the, they're, they're not homogenous. Uh, Strat4 has one voice, essentially. It's the main guy that does it and a couple other guys that are with him. But AP, you know, it could have been written by anybody. So it just kind of depends. I don't see anything very consistent other than those guys. But I, it's always fun to check it against them. Something interesting that Strat4 has been predicting, by the way, that I haven't been seeing covered anywhere, which is kind of fascinating, is they say the Chinese economy is going to blow up in the next year, like crash. It's very interesting. I saw one guy kind of mention it. Recently, there were, there were two dueling articles that came out last week talking about the price of oil a year from now. One guy said it's going to be $108 a barrel. Another guy came back and posted, I think, 28 The guy that said 28 was because he said that the demand from China is going to drop off because the economy is going to bust. And that's the only other guy I've seen that's mentioned it. So it'll be pretty interesting to see if that goes or not. I hope they're wrong. What's that? Uh, it's overheated, the way that they've got things structured. It's not exactly capitalism. The main difference that they have there is that you, they don't allow investment. In order to get raised capital, you have to borrow it from the government, and the government basically just dishes it out to whoever they want. Well, eventually, if enough bullshit schemes come to the, to the table and they borrow money from the government and never pay it back, you end up having a situation like what happened in Japan. Uh, so it'll be kind of interesting to see how that goes. But Yeah, in a bad way. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, and they, they point to the, the main problem is where you see this, all this fussing around with Taiwan right now. They don't think that China is really all that concerned with Taiwan. They're just trying to stand up to them. But they're talking about how that would change dramatically and if the economy melts down. You might see a little bit more messing around going on. So hope they're wrong, but unfortunately. Yes? Oh, no, it doesn't work like that. I've tried that, yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. That's one of the other things, too, we were talking about. You know, I can't actually pick the news. I've tried on a couple occasions to put blow some stuff up, and it doesn't work. But it, it is weird, though, the stuff that I, I'd say we got about a 50% track record on seeing stuff comes in. Like uh, the little the little memes that float across the Internet, and I see a lot of them come by, you know, like all your base and all that kind of crap or whatever. Those things go by on a pretty regular basis. I, I miss about half of them, though, and I end up having to link them about a week later after everybody's already seen them. Um, but the other half is interesting to see him come through early. Um, and sometimes they're just flat out wrong about the ones that are going to take off at all. It just doesn't ever happen at all. So who knows? Hmm. I'm from Kentucky. And uh, in Kentucky, you have to be a basketball fan or you don't get to live in the state. And uh, there's this little game in 1992 where Christian Leitner uh, shot this last second uh, shot and knocked out Kentucky out of the uh, Final Four there. And... Uh, I was actually, and the joke comes from, you guys have probably read uh, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. I, I think it was the first book where they talk about how Dirk Gently had a friend that they had a falling out with, and the friend wrote horoscopes for a living. And he would pick up the uh, newspaper that his friend wrote the horoscopes for every day and read his horoscope just out of habit. And I think it was Sagittarius just letting him be like, you will die a horrible death. You'll be thrown under a bus and stomped on every day. And they were talking about how the newspaper subscriptions had dropped by one twelfth as a result because... All the people that had that month in their horoscope weren't reading anymore. Well, that's actually where the joke is really seated for the Duke sucks thing. It's kind of like, I got a lot of eyeballs, and I hate Duke, so I'm just going to say it all the time, just because. <laughs> Interestingly, I've had some kind of bizarre reactions about that. I, the first time I did a uh, FARC party out in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, I thought I was going to be just skewered alive. Figured, oh, here it comes. All the Duke guys are going to show up. It'll be all, well, I, I, we, the, the party was in Raleigh, and all these UNC fans showed up instead. They are like, Duke sucks! Woo! We hate them too! Bastards! So that was kind of funny. It, it, amusingly, uh, I got interviewed actually about the Duke Sucks thing because of the, uh, the, the FARC.com Duke Sucks Fleet Center thing we tried to pull. Um, and I told a story in the interview, which is actually honest to God true. At the end of uh, the regular season, North Carolina played Duke. Uh, North Carolina came, uh, I, think we went to, I think we went there, I don't know. We played, Kentucky played North Carolina early in the season. It just got killed. Like by 20 points or so. And historically speaking, between Kentucky and UNC basketball, there's been a long rivalry. They're, they've just sucked recently, but they're basically Kentucky is number one for most wins in college basketball, and UNC is number two. Um, so they have those two things combined. And then I'm sitting in a pizza pub after a soccer game watching UNC play Duke, and you never saw so many UNC fans in your life. Not a single person in that room was rooting for Duke, not a one of them. 
even even with all of that that had happened earlier where we even got trashed by nobody. We're like, yeah, I'll see you. Love to see you and see you win. So. Doesn't take long, um, especially the Duke sucks thing. That was one where a lot of people actually don't like Duke. So uh, I talked to a couple of Maryland fans last night. I got a lot of kudos on that too. It, it, it gets to be one of those things where they just kind of uh, pick up on it. In fact, I don't know. Did any of you guys see the uh, the April Fools' page that we had with the fake FARC administration screen? It was basically a whole bunch of check boxes. And one of them was like a pen Duke sucks to any headline. Uh, I got about 200 emails from people saying I've gotten onto the FARC administration page. And I was like, you really think that that was, that was it? But, you know, I, I could see where you maybe would think that, but <laughs> it, was, it was great. Any other questions? Yep. Usually we just try it. Um, I have a big long list of crap that we want to do. Mostly it comes down to us being lazy uh, and not having any time to do it. And I'll give you an example. Like, we've been having problems with the servers this past couple of weeks. And I have a lot of people going, man, are you guys doing okay? I'm like, yeah, it's no problem. It really isn't. It's a very minor thing that's been going on. We've just been kind of curious to see what it is. Uh, and a good example of how this works is I think it was a week ago last Wednesday where the database server was down the entire day, which was just great for me. I just kicked back. I played SimCity all day long. It was awesome. Because no articles were coming into the queue, so I didn't have any to do, any do anything. It also shut my email off. So I was like, woohoo, I'm going outside. This is great. <laughs> so later that evening, I was hooking up with Mike, the guy who does the server administration, to uh, take him out to dinner. I'm contractually obligated to do that for his work on FARC as a result, but he has to take me with him. So, so he came over. We were going to go out and uh, grab dinner. And it was 7 o'clock in the evening. And he said, yeah, I just got the backup loaded up. Um, he's like, in fact, if you want, before we go, I can go ahead and turn it back on. I'm like, no, nah, let's just go. Fuck it. Came back up at midnight five hours later after we all got back from that. So that was that, that's basically how, how it goes when I have crashes like that. The reason it takes so damn long to put it back together, and we could have solved this immediately by throwing the box out the window and just buying a new one. It would have been no problem at all. But it, it just isn't that big a deal. I mean, it is, when you get right down to it, we don't care. Anytime the site crashes, it's like easy on me. So in fact, we've toyed with the idea of occasionally like having a weekend and just shutting the entire damn thing off and like walking away for a couple of days just so you can have some peace and quiet for a while. But probably won't do that. I got people that cover for me on weekends, so it works out good. Yes? Oh, you know what? We tried that. It was scary. <laughs> That's actually one of the things we've had to retool. We added a feature for headline voting for the total farkers, basically. Uh, one of the problems we've had with the uh, duplicates being blocked is, is that the only taglines we ever see are by the people that s submit the article the first time around. I know there's got to be plenty of funny people out there that just don't read the stuff first. Or maybe don't even see their news at all, except if, unless it comes through on FARC, and at that point it's too late. And oftentimes there will be articles that I know we have to hit the main page, but at the time that it comes in, I don't see the tagline that I like. So we added a little feature to where people could submit other headlines, and the total fighters could vote on them up until the thing actually hit the main page. Well, the first time we did it, the top five suggestions that were in the running right before they hit the page, I didn't like. And I was like, hmm, <laughs> they're going to have to retool this a little bit. So uh, we basically put it back to the drawing board to try to make it a little bit more, you know, uh, accommodated to me. The problem, I'm not a very anal guy, but as far as the quality of stuff that gets on the page, I'm actually extremely anal about it. And I was surprised at, at, by that, uh, exactly how anal I was. So, um, But, you know, but that might be a good idea if we're not going to be around for a week, you know. But on the other hand, you know, God knows what would actually show up on the main page. It could get pretty scary. Yeah, actually, that's it, yeah. Yeah, that's what it boils down to, yeah. So... Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yep. It was a long time, actually, but the, the hand, my hand got kind of forced. I was running an ISP when FARC got going, and in 2002, it had finally suffered long enough, and we put it out of its misery and uh, sold it off in an all-stock transaction to a privately held company, which has not worked out in the least for us at, at all. Uh, but then after that, I had nothing to do, and I was kind of like, hmm, well, <laughs> could go get a job, or could see what I can do with this. So that was basically where it had. Interestingly, uh, one of the, uh, the guys that convinced me to start my ISP in the first place had a similar story. He was a guy, he and his uh, son had bought a comic book store, and he didn't like comic books. He didn't give a crap about them. 
But his son had all these comic books in his house, and they were worth money. And he thought, well, why don't you make a business out of this? So they bought it, and it struggled along a bit. And he said the best thing that ever happened to him was he had been working 25 years in a manufacturing plant, and they fired him. And all of a sudden, he had to go do that thing full time. And the minute he showed up, he said the sales went up by a factor of 10. Because, and he, and, but his moral of the story to me, and he was telling me this because I was talking about the ISP that I was running on in my spare time, was he says that by the time you need to go to your business full time, it won't be able to support you. But you have to go. And uh, he was right. And uh, it's happened to me twice now. So it's, it's definitely the case. So um, if, you're, if anybody in this room is thinking about doing something like that, that's absolutely true. By the time it needs you full time, it will not be able to afford you. But that's what it's going to take in order to get there. Oh, actually, I don't make that much off of it all. And the main reason is because I'm stockpiling cash from when we eventually get sued. <laughs> Because I guarantee you it's going to happen at some point. There's already been enough rumblings anyways over the Photoshop contest. I mean, good God, I get a cease and desist like twice a month. I found a very effective strategy for dealing with them. I delete them. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm actually not kidding. It's exactly what I do because only like nine times out of ten, you'll never get a second one. Um, but occasionally you will. There was one, though, that I got from a company, and I, I've basically I've, I've, I've said this before in a couple of interviews I've done, that I won't name because things actually worked out pretty well. But had it not worked out well, I would have nailed them to the wall because it was a company that had no business in a million years coming after us. It's some guys that have received some pretty decent benefit from being mentioned on FARC on a regular basis. And you could probably nail that down to a handful of people. But these guys came after us because of a fo we photoshopped their logo at one, at one point in a contest. And I uh, got a cease and desist, which I deleted. And the next thing I know, I get it at FedEx in the mail to me. Uh, and uh, they were jumping up and down, you know, whatever. But basically what the boiled down to was is that they were trying to come at us under the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is, interestingly has uh, harsher protections for online stuff than regular stuff. Like satire is kind of illegal under, underneath the uh, DMCA. Uh, but only because no one's actually fought this thing yet. Um, there was a time where a United Feature Syndicate was coming after us because we photoshopped. Uh, there, there was a, for better or for worse, cartoon that came out where grandpa got laid or something like that that got pulled from half of the uh, newspapers in the country and uh, we photoshopped that and the uh, United Features sent a cease and desist and just jumped up and down like crazy so I called the AFF because they have guys that work on retainer over there for free to fight this stuff and I talked to one of their attorneys and he's like well is, you got you got a little bit of a problem here and I said well what's that and he's like well I mean he's like this probably is fair use without a doubt but it's a federal judge you got to go in front of, and those guys get a pointer for life, and some of them are pretty loopy. Uh, and he's like, and as an attorney, you don't really want to be in a situation where you're going to walk into federal court without a slam dunk. And he said, in your particular case, this is not a slam dunk. And I asked him, well, why is that? And he said, well, there's, there's a difference between uh, parody and uh, what you're doing. He said, let me give you a good example because you use Weird Al as the example. Weird Al does eat it based off of Michael Jackson's beat it. That's fine. Parody, protected. He can sell it. Doesn't have to have Michael Jackson's permission, you can just do it. But when Weird Al did uh, Yoda based off of the song Lola by the Kinks, he didn't have to pay George Lucas anything, but he sure as hell had to pay the Kinks because he wasn't making a parody of their song. He was making a parody of Star Wars. And that's that's the that's the issue. And basically you can't say that every single one of these photoshops that was submitted is a parody of the cartoon because some of them have nothing to do with the cartoon at all. So he says that's basically. He says it probably still is fair use, but you know it's like you, you don't, as an attorney, you don't want to walk in a situation like that. Interestingly, though, there have been a couple other Photoshop sites. Whenever this happened, I get an email from other sites get these cease and desist. I get contacted by these guys because they figure I probably have gone through something similar before, and they're right. And two or three of these guys have actually gone to small claims court uh, with photographers trying to come after them and have succeeded in winning fair use. So now there's a little bit of case law behind it. And so if they're on top of the fact that it's probably legal anyways. So if it ever comes down to it, it should be fun. But in general, one of the tactics that people will do when they try to sue you is they basically try to run you out of money so you don't ever get to trial in the first place. Perfect example, in Kentucky, there's a company called the Kearns Bread Company, which owns the trademark to Derby Pie, which is ridiculous because everybody and their mom has got a cookbook, you know, going back 100 years with a recipe for Derby Pie and it isn't even the one that they use. I mean, Derby Pie, one of the main comp components in it is bourbon. There's no bourbon in Kern's Bread's Derby Pie, but they got the trademark. And so now they aggressively sue anybody that tries to, to come up with a Derby Pie. And this actually happened to a friend of mine that runs a diner in downtown Frankfort, Kentucky, where he was selling Derby Pie. And one day, the president of the Kern's Bread Company walked in the door and said, hi, oh, some of your Derby Pie. And he did. And he said, told, introduced him, told him who he was. And he says, you need to uh, not sell this or I'll uh, sue you. And uh, Rick threw him out of his restaurant. Got a uh, $2 million lawsuit hit with him the following day. 
And he fought it up until basically it got to the point where he was starting to have to file legal fields to defend this thing. And it didn't matter that much to him, so he just let him roll over. But the test for uh, the, the trademark stuff like that is that it's basically what do people, what does the general public think? Do they think it's a trademark or do they think it's something that shouldn't be? That's why you see really aggressive uh, defense of intellectual property by Coke, uh, because they if if Coke becomes a thing and not a drink that they make, then they lose the trademark. And that's actually happened. Um, I forget with what exactly it was either Kleenex or Jello or something like that, but you can think of a million different. Uh, areas where this actually comes up, and that's why they're so aggressive on it because they lose the trademark, then they don't get a chance to defend it. And Pepsi could come out with a Coke because it's a thing now. Um, so, but that, that's the thing is, I, I, if anybody ever actually does sue us for anything, whether or not we've actually done anything or not, that's the tactic they'll use is to try to run us out of money. And so we're kind of stockpiling for that eventuality because it's, it's going to happen. It's a matter of time. No, not really, because, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, yeah, you get the occasional one where you're like, this jackass thinks blah. Well, okay, you know, I'll get a complaint about that. But when you don't mention it at all, not really, because, um, but there have been certain circumstances mostly boiling down to uh, articles written for college newspapers, actually, um, where, uh, like, I remember there's this one girl talking about um, first time she ever had anal sex in an article in her college newspaper. And of course, we popped this thing up, and she ends up being on radio shows and stuff, and her parents found out. And, you know, she, <laughs> she figured she was pretty safe because her parents didn't read the college newspaper, but when it ended up being national news, you know, it was, <laughs> that became an issue. So only, but even then, it's more of those, it, it, and they end up with the same reaction as the photographer guy that did the squirrel with the giant nuts I was talking about earlier, which is basically that, I, that one of the girls actually stated this. She says, you know, I'm a journalism student. I'm going to graduate in May. I'm going to go be a journalist. And it's scary for me to think that this may be the article that gets more play than anything I write for the rest of my life about me having anal sex for the first time. What a humbling thought. So, yeah. In general, it's not a problem. Um, are you thinking of anything, any kind of specific examples? or? Oh, right. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, since we're actually hitting them and not reproducing it or even commenting about it, that's I think that's where we get away with it. But uh, I, I, again, it's one of those eventualities. I'm sure it's going to happen. I haven't had anybody complain too much about it, but it's probably a matter of time. <laughs> oh, there we go. No complaints. <laughs> I had one guy once ask me, he's like, you know, we should figure out how much lost time is being caused by FARC. And I'm like, oh, no, we shouldn't. <laughs> I don't want to know about it. That's one of the things that I, I, I'll, I'll talk about in person, no problem. But I don't, I don't want to put it on the website anywhere because I don't want FARC to be known as that place where people waste time. Because then that all, FARC ends up being in that same category in web filters of people's offices. And then uh, we, lose, we lose readership because most of our readers read at work. We, we have been submitted by people that are pissed off at the website as, like, hardcore porn. Um, but you can, you can usually contact the guys that are blocking it and say, hey, this isn't hardcore porn. Some jackass sent it in. Because most of those filtering companies, they don't check. They just assume that if it's wrong, somebody will complain. You know, I, I suppose that's easier than actually doing work. Um, what's that? No, actually, well, not that I know of, I should say, but no, none of them has actually blocked us because of that. But um, we have ended up on a few of them before. And I think the, the worst case we ended up with, we ended up getting stuck in entertainment. I couldn't convince these one guys that we were news. Um, and honestly, I can see why they would not think so. But, yeah, we ended up not being able to do that. So, Yeah, hit me. Any which? Oh, you mean like similar stuff or not not really. I mean the the problem is is that there aren't really many sites that are doing what we're doing at all. I mean there's a bunch of like guys that are trying to copy exactly what we're doing, but that's not really close. I mean slash dot and drudge probably. I mean that's probably as, as close as you're gonna get. I I can't I can't get a hold of Drudge for some reason. I keep dropping him emails and stuff. He won't write me back. I did. I did complain to him once, though, because uh, we gave him a huge tip once, and uh, he just went on to pretend like it was his deal that he came up with. That's one of the things that actually irritates me about sites like, like that. Is like, because I, I never in a million years will pretend like we're coming up with this shit. I'm not rolling around finding this stuff, and it's being sent to us. 
you know, this isn't me doing it. I'm just like, oh, that's funny. Up it goes. But I didn't write it. You know, most of the ones we send is not right. I'm not claiming ownership of this. We don't break news. I just kind of happen to see it and it pops up. But uh, sites like uh, Drudge and whatever do claim that they find this stuff, even though they completely exist off of tips, too. Although, Drudge does have a couple guys that do fact check. Uh, in this particular case, it was the morning that Marlon Brando died, which was kind of an interesting story. I was I had to drive to Chicago that day for something. don't remember what. And I was on, in the queue in the morning, get ready to take off, and there was one news flash at 5 o'clock in the morning saying that Marlon Brando died. And I check it out, and it's a TV station in Las Vegas. And it's one of the ABC affiliate, and they're like, Marlon Brando dead, and they got the big career retrospective, but nothing else. And I was like, is this fake? doesn't make any sense. So I checked it out, and yeah, it was a real real news site. It, it didn't seem to be fake. And I was getting ready to just go ahead and kill this thing off until I looked into the comments there because the Total Farkers were already checking it out. They were scouring around on the Internet, and they could not find any other mention of this. But the guy that originally posted it said, I live in Vegas. I'm here. It's early in the morning, and they're running a nonstop Marlon Brando retrospective on the ABC affiliate. I don't know why. They think he's dead. Nobody else does, but they do. And I was like, all right, that's good enough. So I popped it up. So the next thing I know, like literally two seconds later, the smoking gun IMs me, and they're like, Brendo's dead? And I said, I, I, I don't know. These guys in Vegas think he is. <laughs> and uh, they're like, uh, well, have you, have you followed up? I was like, I, I told them what had happened. I said, I, this is all I've got. You check it out. And they're like, okay, well, we're going to go tell Drudge, because they've got Drudge and IM there, so they go tell Drudge. And uh, next thing that happens is, is that uh, it goes up on Drudge. The Total Farkers are tracking this as it goes. It goes up on Drudge. It says, Marlon Brando dead, elaborate hoax, question mark. That was up for about 15 minutes, and then the elaborate hoax was taken off, and then they added family contacted confirmed. And that was the second place that I had seen anything about Brando being dead, and that was kind of fascinating. So I, but, you know, in the meantime, they're talking about Drudge exclusive, blah, 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 and all throughout the media, they're like, and, and Drudge Report had it first before anybody else, and I was like, wait a minute, you fucker. So... <laughs> I, I, I came back later in the day. I'd, 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 I'd come back home. I was, I was, I'd gone out and played soccer. I play soccer like four nights a week, and then I go out drinking afterwards because if I don't, I can't sleep with all the adrenaline. And uh, so I'm drunk, and I'm pissed. I'm like, ah, whatever that fucker drudge. So I, I hit the smoking gun guys were still up. And uh, so I hit him at work, and I, I told him, I said, hey, can you tell that bastard drudge if he ends up doing that kind of thing again to at least give us a little bit of credit? I mean, Christ, we handed that thing on the, to him on a plate. He could at least say, I saw it on FARC. I mean, you know, come on. Uh, didn't get any response back, but I got, I heard from some total Farkers that later that, uh, week on his radio show, he talked about Fark for like half an hour. So I was like, oh, okay, that sounds pretty good. I wrote him a couple emails, but I never heard anything from the guy. So I don't, I don't, I don't hate the guy or not. It's just kind of an odd duck. So, but that was, that was a weird situation. So, yes. Yeah. For the main page we do. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Uh, if they go to the main page, it's on there. Not a, we actually should do that though. You're right. <laughs> There's not one for Total Fork, no. Yeah, we thought about it. things just too freaking big, anyways. And it, it updates every. I mean, it, it would it would not stop updating. The overhead would be ridiculous. I mean, new links come in every minute, so it would be you know have to refresh constantly. There's probably no point in that. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, we got that. Yeah, yeah, we had somebody set that up for us, actually. There's a guy who had it, and he's like, I really like your site, and I wanted to have it go, so uh, here, here's the code. Just put this up there. And I'm like, all right, sure, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, that's actually happening. We've had a bunch of people that write, have written some uh, FARC extensions for Firefox, which are kind of cool. Um, those are on the page somewhere. I, I know they're on there somewhere. I forget where the hell I put them. But, uh, so, yes. Yeah, uh, there's some kind of a technical issue with the comments part of it, um, and I, I'm not I'm not writing this thing, so I don't know what it is, but I know that they there's a, some kind of a holdup that they've been struggling with for a little bit, and I don't know what the hell it is. Yeah, yeah, it's being worked on, but I don't know what the problem is. There's something. Yes. Hmm. I didn't cover it actually. It's the exact same setup that Slashdot has. We're not running Slash code, but independently, without talking to them, we built the same site the same way. Um, FreeBSD, MySQL, Apache, and Perl. It's the exact same stuff. Um, we're doing it with three boxes. They're doing it with nine or 12, I think, or something like that. So. <laughs> Linux sucks! No, I, I, not my choice. I don't I do not do any server administration, and since I don't, I figure I'll just let Mike pick it, and he likes FreeBSD. I'm like, eh, sounds good to me. That's fine, whatever. 
So it, it's kind of funny because, you know, I, there aren't too many exploits for FreeBSD. There's the occasional one for Linux, but FreeBSD, I guess, is off the map. It's the whole Macintosh Windows thing, I guess. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's all right. Have any trouble with it? Yes. Uh, we're between about 45 to 50 million page views. So uh, we do about, I haven't looked in a while. It's like 130 to 200 gig a day, I think. And it's all like text and tiny images. We don't have any uploads at all, so it's not too bad. Yes. Oh, we're co-load. Yeah. We, at one point, we were at my ISP, and right before we moved it, it had crashed one day. Database server went down again. And uh, when it had gone down, I happened to look at the MRTG stats, and our outgoing traffic went from, like, pegged to zero. And I was like, whoa, hello. This is not good. This thing's eating up all the traffic for our entire ISP. i got to move this thing. And so... I, I put a link up saying, anybody who's got a Colo server anywhere, you know, let me know. And I, they, I got a whole, whole bunch of people contacted me at the time. Bandwidth was not cheap at all. And there was, but these uh, one guys, the guys we're hosted with right now, who are really, really good. And I like them a lot. Not the cheapest, but they're all right. Contacted us. And they're like, yeah, we got a thing. We're all Farkers. And that was actually the kicker. Since they were fans of the site, I figured, you know, that's probably the best place to host it because they won't let it go down. And, and in fact, it, 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 it's happened a couple of times. We're like, I'll wake up in the morning and be like, yeah, at 3 o'clock, you developed a problem. We just logged in and fixed it. Hope you don't mind. Thanks. And I'm like, hey. <laughs> Sounds good to me. You have at it. <laughs> uh, as far as, like, actually on the server? <laughs> None, but, uh, the, well, other than, like, setting up the FARC parties. Uh, and going to those and uh, hanging out, that's always a good time. That basically comes from the fact that, like, I'm, I'm a, I am a tremendous extrovert. And speaking of which, by the way, I mean, like, after this talk, if I'm, like, hanging out with the bar, feel free to come up. It doesn't bother me a bit. I'll talk all day long. Uh, I am a horrendous extrovert, and I work at home, so I have to get the hell out of the house every night. And uh, so that's where it came from. It's kind of like I would end up being traveling for uh, business because at one point I was doing uh, database work. Uh, I still have three clients just because they're friends of mine. One of them is down in South Carolina, which is why there's a Charleston Farc party twice a year because I'm there. And uh, I'd be bored hanging out, and so I'd put up a thing saying, Hi, I'm in town. Who wants to grab a beer? I, 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 I'd been working on this project in Spartanburg for years, and the first time I did that, I, it was 2000, 2001, I popped it up. Two guys wrote back. One was in uh, high school, and he's like, I can't come out. I just wanted to say hi, and I don't know, the other guy didn't show up. Uh, and then the last time I was there a year ago, because I've skipped, uh, I put one up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon saying, I'm going to go over to Greenville, next town over. I'm going to be at this bar. Anybody who wants to come out, show up. And 50 people showed up. It was great. It gave me something to do for the evening. I was going to be bored otherwise. So. so it's been amazing watching how that's kind of progressed. Yeah, but it's a little more obvious because I'm actually saying, I'm here. I'm in this bar. I'm hanging out. So, yeah, it, it, it's a lot of fun, actually, because one of the interesting things is, is that people that read FARC are not all tech guys. It, there's an occasional joke I'll see that will come through in a tagline kind of talking about how FARCers all live in their parents' basements and they're all tech guys. But it's not the case. Uh, most of them are not technical people, uh, and all the women that read FARC are hot. I don't know why this is. <laughs> it is it is completely mystifying to me that you could have any kind of a, you know, a bulletin board type computer thing and have hot women read the site, like tons of them. It's insane. I have no explanation for it, but hey, whatever. <laughs> they can roll with it. Yeah, oh yeah, she's hot too. I mean, it's the same deal. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know. Jose can back me up on this. <laughs> Me and Jose and uh, Herman all went to college together, so. Uh, not yet, but I can fight, so I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> I also figured, too, that if there's ever any trouble, not only aside from the fact that I can handle myself, there's also, like, another, you know, usually 20 to 50 people in the room that will probably also try to kill the guy, so. Has a posse. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, whatever I can get my hands on. <laughs> yes. It's actually not bad. Um, the main reason being I can I can take a step back at any time. Um, if, you know, like I've got a little uh, almost two-year-old running around now, and, you know, he wants all the attention I'll give to him. And because of the flexibility that we have with running FARC, I can actually back off of it for, you know, an hour. I can just, you know, go out in the backyard and kick the ball around with him or something like that. So it's no problem at all. And because I'm home at least 12 hours a day, I can leave every single night, no problem. But it, 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 as everything else with having a family, it's flexible. If there's something going on, if he's sick, uh, you know, whatever's happening, 
then you just just kind of adjust it. But I'm I'm luckier than most because I have that flexibility to be able to basically you know make time for whatever I need to make time for. So not yet, it's still working. Yeah, he can say bung and he can say hole, but he can't say bung hole. I'm not really sure why. You'd think he'd be able to, but he can't. Not yet. Any day now, I think. So I've been trying to teach you to say bung hole first. You guys, I don't know that. And so. <laughs> On command. There's something else. I, I, he's he's a, he's a fun guy. He's he's really hilarious. If you guys ever get a chance to meet him, he, he talks all day long. It's great. <laughs> no, no, no. He's named Storm, actually. Yeah. So, and continuing with my long habit of naming things the wrong name, I named a cat Lazy once. That didn't work out. Uh, but uh, he's uh, he's actually really calm and pretty even keel, surprisingly. So I'm, I'm like, yeah, let's hope that holds. But he's a good little guy. Yeah. Yes, actually, it happened most recently last week. I was at a bar in Lexington, and this guy didn't uh, didn't know I even lived in town. He's like, "Are you Drew Curtis?" I'm like, yeah. He's like, "Oh wow, let me buy you a beer." I'm like, "Yeah, okay." But it, it 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 does happen, and it's it's really strange. I mean, not strange, not the people that recognize me. It's just it's just weird just to be somewhere and have somebody know who you are. It happened to me in Vegas like two years ago. I was playing blackjack, and uh, the dealer at one point is like, "Are you Drew Curtis?" And I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "Oh man, I love your website." I was like. <laughs> that was bizarre. Yeah, like give me some good cards for Christ's sakes, you know. What I mean? <laughs> so yeah, it does happen, and it's it's a totally bizarre thing. But it's kind of nice to do because like I've, I've become pretty good friends with Will Whedon, and we've discussed this on a couple of occasions because he's got the kind of celebrity that sucks, where basically there's all kinds of freaky freaky people that are giant fans of his that will recognize him on site and chase him around, you know, wherever he happens to be. He can't turn it off. Whereas me, if I'm at a fart party. I, the minute I walk out the door, I'm nobody, and it's great. It's a good time. Uh, I still want to get back to it. I do, actually. The cooking is the only hobby I have that I haven't been making money off of. Uh, not that I want to make money off of it, but I don't think it's a hobby anymore once you start making money, so I'm kind of out of hobbies unless I do something. So. I, I, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe being a uh, tester for Guinness or something like that. Interestingly, I, I, I ran into a guy when I was traveling around Europe who was living in Munich. Um, runs a site called Digital Burn. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's still up or not. I think it is. Um, it's basically it's a cell phone review site. It's just something that he liked cell phones and he thought, well, I'll just go ahead and write reviews of cell phones for my own edification. And uh, at some point, it got big enough to where a company started sending him cell phones like for free. Like here, we got this new model. Come check it out. Like when I was visiting him back in like late 2002, he got he was starting to get the first camera phones. It was the first one I'd ever seen, and we were playing around with it at the Oktoberfest in a tent with 2,000 drunk Germans singing Don Denver tunes. Uh, it was a good time. They know all the words. It's bizarre. But um, so, but getting back to the original point, uh, it it seems like if you run a website and you start reviewing stuff, eventually, if they see that you're doing it and it becomes any kind of popular whatsoever, they'll just start sending you this crap. So start a beer review site. Maybe that's how you do it. I don't know. Could be the case. Yes. Oh, right. That's actually a joke also. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, there was an interesting uh, uh, talk actually right before me about um, uh, bat mud. Uh, back in the day, I was one of the guys that started Three Kingdoms mud. I don't know if you guys mud at all, but I was one of the guys that uh, founded that. And uh, we had a swear filter on there. And then as a joke, we just started putting other words in there that weren't obscene just because, you know, that was a funny joke. Uh, we started doing that on FARC, and it became a deal where Mike, our systems guy, decided it was a challenge because every time people would find ways around it, then he would have to close that off and then find a way to block the next one and so on and so forth. And uh, so that's basically where that came from. And then we've just added some other things in the filter that, like, I don't particularly care about swears, but I think it's effective when you block them to make people have a really hard time to actually do it because it carries so much more impact when you see the word fuck in a comment on FARC. Because you don't otherwise. You're like, whoa, because you know how that guy had to try like hell and probably got banned for a week for doing it. <laughs> so it carries more impact. And that's what I like is that they, they, it actually increases the power of those words. Oh, well, it's just, it's just a joke. Same deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, basically, yeah, it's just for it's fucking around, basically. So. Me? No, actually, I don't. No. <laughs> yeah, not at all. It's funny. Anybody else? You know, I don't know. It was the first one I looked up and it was available, so I just grabbed it. So 
yeah, didn't search for too long. It was just like, hmm, all right, we'll give it a shot. Yes. What's that? Oh, white lightning? Oh, yeah, no, I didn't. You can actually buy it, though. There's a uh, Heaven Hill Distillery makes some. It comes in a little mason jar. You guys have probably seen it. Yeah. Yeah, strong stuff. Doesn't taste bad either because it's basically alcohol. So. <laughs> oh, not too bad, actually. But it's something interesting. Uh, actually, uh, you can't ship alcohol to Kentucky, not legally. Uh, but I found a, a little outfit in Edinburgh that'll do it. I don't guarantee it'll get there, but it's really funny. What they do is they pack it in these really odd-shaped packages, and it's always funny to see what they're going to be calling it next. They ship it from some guy's house that works there. And so far, it's been lava lamps, uh, do-it-yourself lawn gnome garden kit, uh, and like some kind of uh, a paint set or something like that. But they basically just ship it out, name it something else, and hope it gets there. And it seems to get there pretty much every time. So. Works out pretty well. People keep saying we ought to have a Fark beer, and I think that's a good idea, but I can't make it or ship it in Kentucky, so it's like, well, you know, maybe someday. Maybe if they relax the laws a little bit, we'll do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe we can just license it out to somebody who's got a company already. I don't know. Be a good way to go. Yep. Yes. Where or what? Where? Oh, around the corner, the bar. Yeah. Why, why, why take a long trip, you know? Just <laughs> I got that dorm under stuff. I could drink that all day. And I did, actually. <laughs> Come to think of it. So I'll be doing it again. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by. We'll get done a little bit early.